so okay I usually are very loud so I'm yelling please tell me so I will lower my voice um, so first of all I want to say to the organizer that I appreciate very much uh, the invitation and secondly to the audience so I'm sorry or apologize but um, the topic might be a bit off topic but I'm hoping uh, to make everything accessible to everybody and already I have some help because uh, Sachin and Pierre um, he already introduced some of the examples that I am going to talk about so maybe I can also be a bit shorter so we can every, every sorry that we can leave earlier today it is too late so um, this is going to be the outline the main topic is going to be controllability of quantum systems and mainly of infinite dimensional quantum systems uh, but before doing that, I will introduce some motivating example uh, of a topic that, uh, uh, I mean, in which this kind of uh, results are going to be of interest, of current interest, and also uh, I think it's a, an interesting topic regarding our laureate, because as you know, superconductors are a very um, uh, good example of what a Bose condensate is. So, and by the end of the talk, I will talk about quantum control of the boundary. This is going to be related with TRG's uh, examples. And, well, I will join what is about in this stuff with the other two topics. So, let's move on. So, uh, these superconducting qubits are used for quantum computation and information technologies. And they are very promising technology in order to implement this quantum computation. There are other technologies that are also used, typically trapped ions and NMR quantum computing, but from all of them, superconducting qubits are the one that have been, uh, has been, ha, has suffered a, a stronger development in the last 10, 15 years. So the, the level of the experiments and what they are able to achieve has increased a lot in the last 10, 15 years. And one of the reasons is because these superconducting qubits have a very large coherence time. So, uh, the coherence is the main enemy in order to achieve uh, quantum computation. Mainly because you, in order to achieve quantum computation, you need to, uh, to have uh, 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 that the correlations of your quantum system are preserved during a long time, long enough in order to be able to perform all the operations that you want to do. So in these uh, superconducting systems, these coherent times are for hundreds of microseconds. So it's not that much. But the time that they need to implement one operation is of the order of 10, 50 nanoseconds. So it means that they can do like between 100, 500 operations per coherence time, which is a lot. More than they can do, for instance, in the trapped ions case. Okay. It's just the fidelity for these operations is much better than the other one in the superconducting qubits. So, but there are many other advantages. For instance, these uh, superconducting circuits, they can be printed in actual silicon chips. So they have some nice integration with the current technology. So this could be integrated very well with the actual system for controlling, while the other ones need much harder stuff to be implemented. And another advantage of this one is that uh, by you, you are crafting the superconductive qubit. This means that you are able to control the parameters that are introduced in this system, so you can actually craft the uh, the strengths of the interactions that you need. So you can uh, implement very different devices in order to adapt it to your needs. So I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of this. Uh, okay. So you have to understand these uh, superconducting devices, we need to talk about the Josephson effect, which was predicted in 62 by Josephson, and this is an effect that uh, appears when two superconducting materials are, put, uh, uh, are separated by a very thin layer, okay? And the effect is due to the uh, Cooper pairs tunneling across the junction. So in order to explain it uh, a bit more, so consider that we have, this would be a model of the Jessison uh, junction. We have two superconductors here, and we have here the thin layer. And these superconductors are modeled by uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, and which is, can be described by the complex order parameter, where this R1 is just some constant number which is representing the local density of the conduct of the electrons of the, or the conducting electrons. And there is some complex phase here. If you will not have the two superconductors put together, this complex phase could be gauged out. Okay, so it's irrelevant. 
But when you put both of them together, you cannot gauge out all both phases at the same time. And there is always this phase difference that remains there. And this phase difference is the origin of this uh, Josephson effect. So uh, macroscopically, this Josephson effect is described by these two equations here. So if we look at them, it says that the intensity of the current traversing through the junction is proportional to some constant at the sinus of this phase difference. While uh, the potential applied to the junction is proportional to the time derivative of this phase difference. Okay? So out of these two equations, one can predict these two main uh, Josephson effects, which were predicted by Josephson in 1962. So just to get a hint, so consider this DC Josephson effect. Now suppose that we take uh, the potential, so we do not apply any potential to the junction. This means that phi dot is zero, so phi must be constant, but this constant doesn't have to be necessarily zero. So this means that one has one constant current traversing the junction when you are not applying a potential to it. So this is the this is just some effect. If you now apply some uh, constant potential to the current and uh, DC potential, then the phase is going to vary linearly with time. So if you plug this in in the other equation, what you get is that the current is um, uh, varying with a periodicity that depends directly on the potential of the current, on the intensity of the current. So this means that this Josephson effect allows you to tune very well what are the currents and the voltage that you apply and can be measured very well. That's one of the origins of why these superconducting uh, devices uh, can be used so well in order to uh, operate with them. And well, there's another effect that I'm not going to talk about that was also predicted by Josephson in his original <coughs> paper, but I, mean, I was only to give you some graphs of what is going on. So what is a superconducting circuit? This is just some circuit element in which we are introducing this Josephson junction. Okay. So in this particular case, which is called a current PS Josephson junction, we are just have the Josephson <coughs> junction and some current source, where IE is just the intensity that is supplied by the current source. So now we want to describe this as a quantum system. So what we need to do is to find what is this Hamiltonian in order to describe it. So what we're going to do is to assign or to give what are the expressions for the energy of all the separated elements. And then we are going to write the Hamiltonian. So in addition, when you have a junction, you have a, a, a capacitor. Because you have two superconductors, you have one uh, insulating barrier. So in addition to the effect of the tunneling provided by the junction, you have also to consider the capacity of the charges that are accumulating at the uh, insulator. So the energy of a capacitor is given by one constant times V squared. So if you introduce the second Josephson equation, you get this expression in terms of V. The energy of the junction can be computed by integrating the power with respect to time. So if you plug in both Josephson equations, you get sinus phi phi dot, which can be, you, you can integrate to obtain what is called the Josephson potential. And in addition, you have to compute the uh, energy of the current source, which is, again, computing the intensity times the voltage. But now, this voltage that is dropped at the current source is minus the voltage that is dropped at the Josephson junction. That's why you get this minus sign here. So if you integrate this, you get just this uh, term here. And you want to quantize this. So you have to make the observation that this capacitor term here has the form of a kinetic term uh, in, a, in, Lagrange, in the Lagrangian version of mechanics. So if you just consider that phi is going to be your variable, and you want to take the conjugated variable of that phi, so you can just do the Lagrange transformation, and if you call n this conjugated variable, you can just write the Hamiltonian, okay? This would be the classical Hamiltonian, and just quantize it by the usual way, because phi and n are just satisfying the canonical commutation relations, okay? So that would be the way. Let me focus a bit on the form of this potential. This is called the Wasworth potential, and it's essentially a uh, way. Okay. This is called yes. Tilde Wasworth potential. Tilde Til Wasworth potential. Why Tilde? But uh, a Wasworth is always Tilde, otherwise it's a cosine. No? Til I would say. Potential. So it looks this way, as you are saying. 
we have just a cosine there. Okay, that's why it's called a washboard potential or, or tilt washboard potential. Would you call it still washboard if it wouldn't be tilt? I don't think so. Okay. So let's focus on another example. This is called the RF squid. Now we have just uh, just a transaction and some intactants here. So we can repeat the same trick, compute what's the energy provided by the intactants, and in this case this is proportional to the magnetic field that is traversing the inductance. Now the point is this magnetic field is not only coming, you want to apply an external magnetic field to it, so the total magnetic field that is traversing the inductance is providing from the external magnetic field that you apply plus the magnetic field that is originated at the junction because of the current that it comes from. So in the end, this, in addition to the um, cosine potential, you're getting this quadratic term here coming from the B square. And the fact that you have phi and phi A, this is the, extern this is the change of phase coming from the externally applied magnetic field. So how are they uh, using this in order to produce the um, superconducting cavities. So essentially, oh, okay. they just focus on one of these wells, and all the constants that are appearing there, they can be very fine-tuned. So these they are depending on the construction parameters of the of the junction. Okay, they can be tuned experimentally. So they tune them in order that only two levels fall in, in each of these walls. So they use these two levels to produce a qubit. Okay. So uh, they, they treat this as a two level system. So there's a very rough approximation here in which they also are um, misconsidering all the levels there. And that is a, a, a source of decoherence because even if you, they consider that these levels are not there, they are there. So they are struggling all the time in the experimental devices in order to avoid the interaction with all the levels that are coming from there. So um, besides these effects, I will try to convince you why this is not also it's not a very good idea also to tighten the level, the system in order to get just the two levels. And that's why considering infinite dimensional systems directly and controlling them directly could provide a way in which one could. Uh, tune or control these quantum systems better. So in order to handle, in, instead of handling these extra levels as a problem, we could use them as a resource. For instance, we would, would consider higher wells in order to have more levels, still using these two levels for the computation, but having the other ones, I mean, just controlling errors or something like that, if you're able to devise a, a good control of this problem. So, Shallowness important to have a reasonable tunneling uh, probability. Yes, so they, that's a problem for them. So the point is, if they uh, put it very sharp, such so that the higher level is very close to that, they have a problem with tunneling, actually. But within the region where they end up working, this is high enough so that this tunneling can be suppressed. So I'm speaking very loud, maybe. Sorry. So is it better? Okay. But it is suppressed, uh, but not in order that the next level is going to uh, introduce them any problems. And actually, they use this tunneling effect in order to provide the measurements because they, increasing the current, they tighten more the washboard, and then the higher level tunnels out. So when this tunnels out, it introduces a current in the system which they use in order to know if the system was in the upper state or in the lower state. So actually, this this is uh, playing a very important role. Okay, so let's focus on controllability of quantum systems. So, in order to control a quantum systems, what you have to do is okay. You first need to solve the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, where here H is some family of self-adjoint operators, which in general are going to be unbounded operators. So. 
normally in undergraduate courses, one is still that working. This can be solved, no problem, it's a linear system, and the solution always exists. But uh, that, that is false, not true. It's in, actually, when you consider here general families of unbounded operators, it's very hard to prove that solutions exist. There are very few general theorems providing existence of solutions in this case. And when there are general theorems, it's almost as hard to prove that your actual Hamiltonian satisfies the conditions of the theorems as providing the solution yourself. So it's really a very hard matter. Now, when the solution does exist, then it is given in terms of what is called a unitary propagator, which is a two-parameter map into the uh, unitary group of the Hilbert space, which is strongly continuous with respect to the two parameters. And that satisfies this condition. Now, if it exists, then given an initial state psi zero, your solution of the Schrodinger equation is given in terms of uh, this psi t. Now, before going to the actual the infinite dimensional case, let's have a look at what happens in the finite dimensional case. So here, for simplicity, so let's consider the system is finite dimensional, so we have just uh, an end level state. And we have just linear controls, which means okay, I'm having now two self-adjoint operators in this finite dimensional space, so I have two Hermes and matrices. And my controls here are going to be just one real function that depends on time. So I'm able to control the intensity of some interaction that I'm plugging into the system. And by controllability, what I want to achieve is, okay, if I'm given some initial state and some target state, 5C, which is given, so I want to devise this function of time in order that my state evolves from the initial state psi zero to the final state psi five. Now, this will be the ultimate objective of control theory, right? So devising which curve actually does that. In addition, you can put yourself additional problems like, okay, let's try to solve the problem of optimal control. So I want to find a curve that solves my problem that minimizes some certain functional. So I want to minimize the time in which I, ch I achieve that. I want to minimize the energy in which I achieve that or I want to minimize some combination of both of them, for instance. So this is the optimal control problem. But before you start thinking about these things, you need to start thinking if such a curve is going to exist at all. So it's, it's, does curves exist that join any initial state with any final state? So uh, in the infinite dimensional case, for instance, as the example that I was showing you, I have just one control, but I have my space of states is infinite dimensional. So it's not clear at all if with just one control I am going to be able to connect any, any two states. So for instance, consider you start in an, in an eigenstate of the energy and you plug in the control. Who is guaranteeing you that you are not going to end up in some, in, in some uh, invariant space of the Hamiltonian or something like that? So any other state outside this invariant space is not reachable for you. So this is the kind of questions that we are going to be addressing today. So in the finite dimensional case, there is a very well-known answer to the problem in the quantum situation. And this is given, uh, the, the answer is just, okay, you have to study just the dynamical Lie algebra. So the dynamical Lie algebra is the Lie algebra generated by the two of Hamiltonians that appear in the linear control system. You take these two operators, you compute all the uh, Lie algebra generated by them. And then it, it can be proved that the reachable set, so the orbit that, uh, of, of states that you can access starting from some initial state C0 is actually uh, is an exponential map of this dynamical Lie algebra. So if uh, uh, the dynamical Lie algebra coincides with that of a group that acts transitively in your space, then the system will be controllable. And in the case of a quantum system, it is enough to find that your dynamical Lie algebra is, uh, contains at least the Lie algebra of the group UN. So you just need to find some uh, Lie algebra that has at least n squared generators made of uh, anti hermitian matrices. Okay, this is enough. It's a very well-known result. Okay? This is known essentially in the 80s or something. So let's check what happens in the case of the harmonic oscillator, the quantum harmonics oscillator. So here it is. It's very well-known. And we will consider the harmonic oscillator algebra. Shanshin was already doing all the computations for me. So this is the creation operator and the annihilation operator, the number operator. So if I call H0 the purely harmonic part, 
so the, the usual harmonic oscillator. And I consider I'm controlling the system with just this linear control, which I will call H1. Now I want to compute the dynamical algebra here. But first, I will try to do something like they are doing in uh, superconducting fluids. So I consider the truncations of this harmonic oscillator. So let's just consider the first end, in, end levels of this harmonic oscillator and check if this is controllable in finite dimensional case. So I just consider uh, the matrices defined by uh, uh, taking the brackets with the first end levels. And it's a matter of uh, sitting down and calculating that indeed this uh, Lie algebra, the dynamical Lie algebra generated by these two matrices has indeed dimensions n, squ n squared. So any truncation of the harmonic oscillator is going to be controllable by this just one field that I'm introducing there. So any truncation. For all n, I get controllability. What happens uh, in the infinite dimensional case? So I can do the same computations. I have H0, I have H1. I control all my commutations here. And well, what I get is if I compute the commutation between H0 and H1, I get the momentum essentially, IH2. But if in I further compute the commutator between H1 and H2, I get the identity. So this algebra closes and it only has four elements. So I have to control an infinite dimensional system only with a four dimensional Lie algebra. So the harmonic oscillator in infinite dimensions is not controllable. The second surprise, no? So I have a system in which every finite dimensional truncation of it, it turns out to be controllable. I go to the infinite dimensional one, and it is not. Uh, this can be surprising. Mm, the fact is that maybe the definition of controllability that I gave you was not very appropriate for the infinite dimensional case. And that is what we are going to address. Now. But first of all, why is all this happening? So the point is, if we actually compute the matrices here to show what is going on, and we compute the commutator of the Q and the P, it turns out that Q and P, it should be the identity, but they are not. And this is clear why not. We have finite matrices. We cannot represent the canonical commutation relation with finite matrices, even with bounded operators. The trace of such a thing has to be always zero. So when you truncate, you are always going to get here that the last element is going to give you minus n minus 1 in order that the trace of this matrix comes out 0. So this small deviation from the identity is actually the one that is allowing you to obtain the full uh, uh, Lie algebra of the unitary group. So a small deviation here because of the truncation makes everything controllable. So this is the definition of uh, approximate controllability. How much time do I have? So, uh, sorry, I lost the point. So we will say that a linear control system is approximately controllable if for each pair of states and every epsilon bigger than zero, it exists one time bigger than zero and one control, such that we can came, come as close as these target states as we want. So this, which might be disappointing from the point of view of control because we are not reaching actually the state, is actually a very reasonable uh, definition in infinite dimensions. Why? Well, because actually uh, the Hilbert space is only defined up to uh, equivalence classes of convergent sequences. So actually achieving the exact state is not actually very uh, reasonable, not even in the Hilbert space sense. So this is the reasonable condition of convergence that you want to have. Uh, and moreover, this is the uh, natural to expect if you are in a system in which every finite dimensional truncation is controllable and you go to the infinite dimensional setting. So by using the finite dimensional controllability of the finite dimensional setting, it's not very hard to prove that this should be work. It should be work. Okay? Uh, it's not trivial, but it's easy to expect. It, okay? So this is the good choice for controllability. Now, uh, we uh, so just for introducing you um, what are the kind of conditions that one has to ask for the system in order for it to be controllable. So consider now the linear control system that I was giving you before, but now we are in the infinite dimensional setting. So H0 and H1 are really unbounded operators, and I am asking for them that H0 has a, a complete orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, okay? And moreover, that all these uh, eigenvectors 
have to be in the domain of H1. Of course, all these operators, the sum of these operators have to be self adjoint. So you remember what um, has been said in the previous talk. So whenever you have a self adjoint operator, you have to fix a domain for it. So we are assuming here that the domain of this operator is the same no matter what value of t you're taking here. And moreover, that uh, H0, which is fixed, has this orthonormal basis. Now, uh, in 2009, it was proved that a system of this kind was actually approximately controllable, provided that these two further conditions are uh, satisfied. So the first one is some non-resonant conditions between the um, eigenvalues. And the other one is exactly, if you can think about it, that this Hamiltonian H1 has to connect at least every two consecutive eigenstates of the operator H0. This is precisely to avoiding that you fall not in some irreducible space of the operator. So if for some n this does not hold and is zero, then you are not going to be able to uh, step out of the uh, invariant subspace. OK, so now, as I was saying, we are going to consider uh, the existence of solutions of the uh, time dependent Schrodinger equation. So we are going to focus on Hamiltonians of this form for simplicity, where HT is going to be some self-adjoint Hamiltonian, where we are going to have a fixed domain for every value of the time t, and we, each of these HIs are going to be symmetric operators defined on this domain t, this is defined. And moreover, okay, smooth functions of time, these conditions can be relaxed, but what is more important is this technical condition that appears here, which is saying that all the norms of these operators have to be bounded by the graph norm of the operator itself. And this constant k here cannot depend on time. Okay. Uh, so with that condition, we were able to prove that uh, under these conditions, there exists a strongly differentiable unitary propagator UTS that solves the time dependence of the equation. So it's a rather general theorem. The problem is, OK. Case by case, you will need to go and verify these conditions. But in the situation that we are dealing with uh, differential operators, like it's going on in the uh, superconducting case, so I'm thinking I missed one slide. No. So the slides are new, so I thought I have to say something. OK. So this is a rather general situation. This Hamiltonian is going to look very much like this the Hamiltonian that is going to appear in the sub case of superconducting qubits. And we just have to be sure that this condition is verified. So having that, uh, there's another important issue, which is the stability of the evolution. Now consider that we have two Hamiltonians of the kind that I was considering. And now I have two families of functions, f and g. So uh, with, uh, in the case of the previous, uh, so when this two Hamiltonians satisfy the previous set of conditions, sorry these conditions. Then for every t and every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists some delta such that if these two sets of functions are close enough, then the evolutions are also close enough, okay? as close as you want. This, has, uh, this result is important for two reasons. First of all, because it allows you to avoid many of the technical conditions that appear in many of the approximate controllability, uh, approximate controllability problems, like the one I was telling you before. So this condition of uh, these non-resonant conditions of the eigenvalues and the property of uh, this linking property between the eigenstate that has to provide H1, this property can be avoided by using an approximation statement <coughs> of this kind. So even if your Hamiltonian does not satisfy this condition, you are going to be able to prove that it's approximately controllable. You are just going to approximate a Hamiltonian that is close enough to it in, uh, that avoids that uh, condition. But moreover, this condition is also important for an experimental point of view. It means that if your controls are not perfect, so once you have devised the controls that you want to achieve, you know, so you have solved the problem, you know what you want to achieve, and you go to the experiment and apply it, you want that you are going to introduce errors in your implementation, and this is giving you control of the errors that you are going to commit. Okay? So if your error is bounded by this delta, then you know that the target state is going to be approximated also within that epsilon. It's also very important. So with all that information, what I can tell you is that uh, we can prove that 
uh, Hamiltonians of this type are approximately controllable. So, using the conditions above, it is not hard to prove that Hamiltonians of this type verify those conditions, and then we can apply the approximability, uh, the approximate controllability theorem by Chambriano. So, actually, all the Hamiltonians of superconducting qubits that appear, the ones that I was devising there, uh, are going to fall in this category of approximately controllable quantum systems, infinite dimensional quantum systems. And so, quantum control on the boundary. So, this is a slightly different topic. We are going back to a time dependent Schrodinger equation, and as I was telling, the situation for guaranteeing the existence of solutions of the time dependent Schrodinger equation is even worse because all these unbounded Hamiltonians, each one can have a different domain. Okay? It's not only that the Hamiltonian itself depends on time, but the domains can also depend on your parameter. So, uh, of course, this means that the existence of solution is uh, compromised, so you need that uh, there is a matching between the domains of uh, if that are infinitesimally linked together, let's say. If you, let's say you make an approximation of each HT. So you evolve by a fixed time and you go to the next. So you need that the image of one Hamiltonian falls down in the domain of the next one in order for the uh, solutions to be well defined. This imposes severe conditions on what is the family of domains that you can choose. But, uh, can, you, can you define a new T, which is a function of the old T? and then use it as a time-independent parameter. So what do you mean? A function new tau parameter, which is a function of old time, uh -huh. so that it becomes time-independent. The domain. That's exactly what we are going to do. Not by a function, but by a unitary transformation that depends on time. Okay. But first, so, of course, there are difficulties here that might be avoided, but actually what we want to do is use this freedom in choosing the domain as our control parameters, as our family of control parameters. So what we mean when we, mean, when we say we are going to control the system by the boundary is saying, okay, we are going to take some fixed Hamiltonian, just one Hamiltonian, it's not going to be time dependent. And we are going to change the boundary conditions that define this Hamiltonian. So if you go back to the case of the Laplace operator that TRG was going, we can have village state boundary conditions, normal boundary conditions, but you know, there are many more boundary conditions there, like the Robin ones, or many other families which I'm going to talk about. So the idea is let's change the parameter defining that boundary conditions and use it to control the state of the system. Okay. This has the advantage that one do not have to uh, apply some external field to your system in order to control it. You are just playing what, what is going on on the boundary. And this could avoid further sources of decoherence and the manipulation of some quantum bits. So you have some typically uh, one important source of the coherence is that when you have the circuit, you uh, address it or you control it by applying some strong external field to it. This introduces the coherence in the system. But if you are allowed to control the state of the system just by changing the boundary condition, in principle, you are going to avoid the coherence. So that's the idea behind this. And uh, so one more thing to say is that uh, this type of control is genuine on infinite dimensions. So there is no way that you can try to handle this case when you're with finite dimensional systems. Okay, you have to treat all these difficulties that I was introducing before. So this is uh, the kind of thing that we can do in order to uh, transform this uh, domain dependent problem into one domain that does not depend on the... So this is one way of uh, addressing the problem. It's not that it's the uh, unique way. So for instance, if you ask that this family of um, self-adjoint operators that just depend on the domain that you choose for them, each one of them has a, a complete orthonormal base okay, of eigenstates. And then in terms of this base, you choose just one value, C, okay, and you fix this as a reference extension. And since you have a set of orthonormal bases, for each value of C, you can define a unitary operator in your Hilbert space that maps each orthonormal base into a different one. So we are going to take these uh, unitary transformations. Now we need not only to transform this as a unitary operator in the Hilbert space, but in order to do everything correctly, what we need to do is that this unitary transformation transforms the domain of each operator into the corresponding one. So this has 
strict, uh, a much difficult condition to meet. This is guaranteed if you have an orthonormal basis, you can construct it immediately. It's always granted that it will happen. That this condition is very high, it is very hard. But again, in the case of Hamiltonians of the type that we are considering, magnetic Laplacians or Laplacians, there are uh, a lot of uh, asymptotical conditions of the eigenvalues of the problem or the eigenstate that you can use in order to prove that this condition is, actually to, is, is going to be met. So using this unitary transformation that now is going to depend on time, one can transform the problem which was uh, with a fixed Hamiltonian and time-dependent domain into a problem that is uh, with a fixed domain and time-dependent. And this is the most notable example. So consider that we have just one interval here, the Laplace operator, and the domain is just the space of functions that, such that uh, the second derivative is bounded, so this is the sole space of order two, and now we are considering these boundary conditions, which are almost periodic boundary conditions, okay? If I take this phase out, I have just periodic boundary conditions. Like we call these quasi-periodic boundary conditions, but we are allowing this change of phase in the uh, of the wave function and of the derivative. Which, uh, by the way, these are exactly all the self agent extensions that one can take to have a well defined momentum operator on the interval, which we were talking about earlier. So, this case can be solved completely for each value of alpha. These are the eigenvalues, these are the eigenstates. No? Now, if we assume that this parameter alpha depends smoothly on time, we can define the transformation that I uh, introduced previously. Everything goes well, so uh, the conditions that I was mentioning, they are preserved. And one can show that uh, plugging this in, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, doing the time-dependent transformation, original problem becomes and uh, transforms in this equivalent problem, which we have this Hamiltonian that now depends on time. Now, here we have our time-dependent parameter, and we have the price that we, it appears some this linear term here, which is proportional to the time derivative of this, uh, of this uh, parameter here. Remember, this alpha is the parameter of the boundary conditions. But now the domains are fixed. Okay? So I like to mention this because uh, uh, this, we call this the quantum Faraday law. This is exactly the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation that you get after doing this case transformation with the time-dependent potential. And you, so you, for free, you get this term here, which is um, proportional to theta, which is the variable here. So this is a constant electric field in your system, which is proportional to the time derivative of your magnetic potential here. So that's why we call this the quantum Faraday law. The nice thing is we derived it just from first principles. We didn't have to postulate that the quantum Faraday law has to behave this way. Uh, and this is a very nice relationship between this system and the superconducting circuits that we have before. Essentially, this uh, phase here can be uh, taken to be the phase difference between the two superconducting phases of the complex parameter that we have. So, uh, we hope that we are able to define uh, or to provide a different uh, let's say, description of these superconducting circuits in terms of uh, systems of this kind, in which we have some set of intervals for the Laplacian, some potential vectors that we appear as these magnetic phases there. So let me say it in another way. My system with quasi periodic boundary conditions and the standard Laplacian turns out to be equivalent to this other system in which I have a particle moving in a circular wire surrounding a magnetic field whose magnetic flux is proportional to 2 pi alpha. Okay, that's the thing. This phase here can be interpreted as the phase that appears between the two superconductors. So actually, one could treat to define the superconducting circuits as a, a planar graph, like these ones, okay, where um, the Josephson junction is treated as a delta-like potential. Okay? That's what we would like to do. Because we have very well control on how this system should evolve. And this way, we would avoid 
all the approximations that take place in the right. So having to account that in order to get those levels, I had to introduce some quantization in terms of the charges and the current. This is not very uh, natural. It works because uh, for the experiment, this is good enough in order to get the levels. But from a theoretical point of view, it's not very natural how you get to this kind of Hamiltonians. So if we are able to reproduce this out of system of this kind, that would be very nice. Actually, if it is the quantum Faraday law, then what is the quantum Pain's law? It is the minus sign, the delta E, delta T, equal to minus 1 by C, delta V, delta T. This is the Faraday's laws of actual equation. It appears at a third term. Now my question is if the minus sign, minus 1 by C, delta V, delta V, minus sign is due to the Pain's law. What is the idea the quantum Pain's law? If it is the quantum Faraday law, then it must have to be some quantum Pain's law. There must be some quantum Pain's law. Uh, can you show me? How it is coming out? Well, uh, uh, actually, what is your question? Can you rephrase it? May I go to board? OK. Let's go. OK. Yes. <laughs> So you mean the quantum lens law or the quantum ampere law? What are you thinking about? Minus sign. Okay, you can discuss it later. Later. Ah, you, you want the reactive field? Uh, okay. So the point is, this very special system of one interval, one magnetic flux that I was describing, actually can be generalized very naturally to a full family of planar graphs in which I have a full quantum circuit with a lot of magnetic fluxes there. And uh, in all these situations, I am able to um, do the same transformations that allows me to put this uh, domain-dependent problem into a uh, uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian problem. And if you look at the form of the Hamiltonian that we have here, the Hamiltonians will always be of this form, where now these alphas are going to depend of each interval. What is nice about these Hamiltonians is that they fall in the category of Hamiltonians that we have proved that they are approximately controllable. So any system of this kind is going to be approximately controllable also. So we have all the technical details there. It's only that it would be nice to have a description of the superconducting circuits in terms of this language. So, uh, but this is uh, ongoing research. There are already preliminary results, and there are some papers in which they are claiming that they are able to reproduce the Josephson equations out of models like this. But I mean, I'm not very confident of what they are doing because uh, they are just taking a lot of assumptions in between that I'm not very sure about why they take them. So of course, when you know where you are going to go, then it's easy to take assumptions in order to get the result that you will. But I'm not sure if this is the correct way of doing that. So, and this is some references.